Θέλει και μια όρθια φωτογραφία, οπότε η φωτογραφία πάντοτε έχει δίκιο. Για να είμαστε κυνηγάνε μετά. Ε, όλα κανονίζει η υπηρεσία, τα κανονίζει όλα. Αφού λοιπόν μπήκαμε στην ιστορία μέσα από την εικόνα που είναι το λογικό πράγμα της σημερινή εποχή δύο λόγια εισαγωγικά στα ελληνικά στη συνέχεια συμφωνήσαμε να γίνει η συζήτηση στα αγγλικά για να βοηθήσουμε και τον Μπομπ να έχει τη μεγαλύτερη δυνατή συμμετοχή Τα εισαγωγικά λόγια ένα βιβλίο παρουσιάζεται αλλά και μια διαδρομή παρουσιάζεται μια ανάγνωση της ελληνικής οικονομίας και του τρόπου με τον οποίο ελπίζει η οικονομία αυτή να επανέλθει σε ένα εξυπηρετήσιμο, βιώσιμο, πείτε το όπως θέλετε χρέος και να δει το μέλλον. Καλωσορίζουμε λοιπόν εσάς που καταφέρατε και ήρθατε τη σημερινή όχι τόσο ελληνική, όχι τόσο αθηναϊκή ημέρα από πλευράς καιρού και τον Μπομπ Τρά, ο οποίος ξαναβρήκε το δρόμο που τον έφερε πριν από αρκετά χρόνια στην Αθήνα να ζήσει την περιπέτεια του μνημονίου. Now shifting to English, welcome to all of you, welcome to Bob Tra, who has been the resident of the IMF in Athens for quite a long time and who has lived for close, from close enough the uneasy task of trying to bring the Greek economy to something close to health and the Greek debt close to something close to sustainability or whatever. He has written a book and today we are going to have not the presentation of a book but the presentation of the adventure of the Greek economy and hopefully something about the perspectives of the Greek economy. So ladies first, I would like to ask Miranda Xafa to to give us her reading of the book, but also to acquaint us with her view over the IMF phenomenon looking at the Greek economy. Miranda Xafa. Everybody and thank you for inviting me. So I will speak uh, about debt sustainability primarily and of course about Bob's book. Uh, the deep crisis that erupted in Greece in... Uh, can you hear me? The deep crisis that erupted in Greece in 2009 led to a 25% contraction in real GDP a decline that is comparable to what happened in the United States during the Great Depression of the 1930s. The legacy of this crisis is a record high debt level amounting to 335 billion euros at the end of 2018, the year that Greece exited the third memorandum, which is equivalent to approximately 180% of GDP, by far the highest in the European Union. Uh, it's, it's still the highest in the European Union, despite the fact that in 2012 there was the so-called PSI, the private sector involvement, that uh, wrote down the Greek debt by 106 billion, and that was followed by a buyback at the end of the same year that reduced the debt by a further 20 billion. And this is the, the largest ever uh, right, debt write down in the history of sovereign crisis globally. 
Bob's book presents a number of proposals and guidelines that would contribute to the reduction of the debt ratio by two thirds, that is to below the Maastricht limit of 60% of GDP from 180% at present. There is no agreed metric for sustainable debt. It is not a static measure. Sustainability is not a yes or no question. It depends on many factors. Techni technically, we say that debt is sustainable when the ratio of debt to GDP is stable and is foreseen to remain stable or to decline in the foreseeable future. This brings, of course, GDP into the equation. Greece's debt can be sustainable even if it is growing in nominal terms, provided GDP is growing faster. Uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff, two Harvard economists, have uh, shown that the debt ratio above 90% of GDP slows down growth considerably. Lower growth impacts debt sustainability negatively. And so this result means that uh, a country needs to make a bigger fiscal effort in order to reduce the debt ratio if that ratio exceeds 90% of GDP. Greece is at twice that level now. Another interesting metric is that the IMF considers that emerging market countries become vulnerable to debt crisis when their debt ratio exceeds 60% of GDP. Argentina got into trouble two years ago with a debt ratio of just 80% of GDP. The bottom line is that the level of debt is important, but there is no silver bullet. Debt sustainability depends on a number of factors, including the maturity profile of the debt. Greece's debt matures over the next 40 years, whereas the bulk of Argentina's debt matures over the next five years. So even though Greece's debt is much higher, Greece's debt ratio is much higher than Argentina's, it is more easily sustainable because the payments are spread over a much longer uh, period. In 2018, the Eurogroup granted further debt relief to Greece mainly by capitalizing the interest due to the EFSF, the European Financial Stability Facility, which funded Greece's second adjustment program. Uh, the main uh, uh, debt relief that Greece got was by capitalizing interest until, 19 until 2032. Uh, in 2032, the grace period ends, and debt, including capitalized interest, starts being repaid. The IMF considers, therefore, that the debt is sustainable until 2032, but uh, it is not certain that it is sustainable beyond that period. Other variables that affect debt sustainability include factors within Greece's control, namely the country's growth rate in the next five to 10 years, the primary surplus it achieves during that period. The primary surplus is important because it enables the country to pay interest using its own resources rather than by resorting to further borrowing. And third, the sources of funding government spending, including um, uh, privatization receipts and the interest rate at which the country can borrow in international markets. Obviously, the higher the interest rate and the lower the growth and the primary surplus, the worse the debt dynamics become. Debt sustainability also depends on who owns the debt. If the debt is owned by domestic residents, then it's easier to repay it because uh, interest is, comes out of one pocket and goes into another. For example, in Italy, banks own most of the Italian debt, and so the banks pay interest to the government, and the government receives that money and spends it. The same applies to Japan. Japan Japan's debt is all, also held mostly domestically. But in Greece, it's the opposite. In Greece, most of the debt is held uh, abroad, and so Greece 
has to transfer abroad significant resources to service that debt every year. The transition to a sustainable debt path requires action on three fronts. First, structural reforms that improve Greece's growth potential, reforms that reduce wasteful public spending, and ensure the viability of the pension system. And third, resolution of the non-performing loans in the banking sector to ensure that the banks can fund the economy while maintaining capital adequacy. Without action on all these fronts, uh, debt sustainability will not be achieved. The latest IMF report that was published last November shows that uh, Greece paid 18 billion euros over the seven year period from 2012 to 18 to cover the losses of uh, loss making public enterprises in the transport, uh, energy, defense, mining, and shipyards. Um, this translates to 2.6 billion a year that we pay to cover the losses of these enterprises. We've been debating for three years now whether we should cut the pre-2016 pensions in order to save two billion euros from the budget. And at the same time, we've been spending more than that, supporting ailing enterprises uh, uh, by using up 2.6 billion a year, which is equal to the revenues we receive from the ENFIA tax. This is a prime example of wasteful public spending that increases Greece's debt and also gives rise to a stock flow discrepancy because the government provides guarantees when these entities borrow, for example, the railway company, or say, and this, uh, these guarantees never show up in the budget, but they show up in uh, Greece's debt once the guarantee is called. Our European partners have promised to re-examine Greece's debt sustainability in 2032, when the grace period for EFSF loans ends, and to grant further debt relief if necessary. But no amount of debt relief will ensure debt sustainability without reforms that improve Greece's growth potential and creditworthiness. Um, during the program era from 2010 to 2018, successive governments viewed conditionality as a necessary inconvenience in order to avoid disorderly default, rather than as an opportunity to tackle long-standing problems like uh, red tape and barriers to market entry and competition. Efforts to achieve a much needed and deep structural transformation of the economy failed due to reform inconsistencies, delays, reversals, and the resistance from vested interest groups. You will remember the fight to move uh, non-prescription drugs from pharmacies to supermarkets. Um, in the end, the pharmacists won. As a result of this development, the economy rebalanced through recession rather than through productivity enhancing structural reforms. Official creditors have lent Greece more than 200 billion euros, a record high amount, and they hope to get this money back. This is why they insist on reforms that would help improve uh, Greece's competitiveness and credit worthiness in the post-program period. This is in our best interest as well. Uh, Bob's book, based on his long experience at the IMF, can help us keep our eye on the ball. A generous pension spending, the annual payment of a social dividend, and unnecessary public sector hiring all reduce the fiscal space available for tax cuts and hinder the government's efforts to reduce the debt ratio rapidly and uh, get Greece upgraded to investment grade. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Miranda. Uh, Miranda Xafa has uh, guided us through the thicket of debt sustainability. 
whatever the metrics, but she also showed us how things happen in Greece with the very simple equation ENFIA equals pension increment or reduction equals spending to keep alive public entities. This is how things happen. But also when she said that in the end, the pharmacies won versus the supermarkets, she indicated that he or she who holds political influence rather than power, at the end of the day, will win. So when we discuss reforms, we have to, pe to keep that in mind. I think that her final finding is that not everything goes right, and possibly that it is rather difficult for Greece to reform, but at the end of the day, it's Bob Tra that will give us his, his own reading. And now over to Vasily Rapanos, who is more or less the man to talk us of fiscal, of things fiscal, for his own reading of Bob Tra's book. Vasily. No, things get mixed up, you know. Yeah. Okay, I would like to thank you very much for, in, for the invitation. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I read books, I have a peculiar, peculiar way doing that look at the front page, I go at the end and start looking at the references and bibliography. So a surprising aspect of the book is that no references, no bibliography at the end. And I said, okay, my God, let me go through the book. 25 chapters, small chapters. And going through the chapters, what I discover is that this book is not written for an economist only, but an average citizen who follows developments in, in the daily press and daily news can easily read and understand the book. So this is one of the big advantages of the book, in my view, that can be read by anybody who is not an expert in economics. Each chapter is well structured, and I like also the way uh, it is written in the sense that from the very, very beginning, uh, the author goes to some aspects of growth which is totally neglected by, you know, uh, authors uh, of reports about Greece, etc. Aging of the population. That's a very, very important aspect on which we don't give much attention today. One remark, however, it was that Troika, so to say, that imposed, that raised the, the age of retirement to 67. All his calculations almost are for the age between 24 and 64. So I'm asking the question, if we change the scenario for debt sustainability or for growth to, let's say, to the age of 67, does this improve the prospects of the Greek economy and the sustainability? Uh, a second aspect, uh, and I'll, I'll try to be very, very brief, is that uh, the author mentions in many, many parts of the book the need for reforms. However, no reforms are really mentioned by the author. And this is quite important in my view because important reforms have, been, uh, have taken place in this country. Forget expenditure cuts, uh, in, uh, tax increases, etc. Who remembers that we have had a change in the civil procedure law, Politicodicas Politicis Economias? We have a totally new law for, corporate, uh, for, for corporations. Everybody remembers the famous law 1920, Hiria Anonymous Eteries. Now we have a totally new uh, code. These are very, very important reforms. 
And I think that they deserve mention in these reforms, which have been forgotten by almost everybody. And also, I think that uh, uh, an aspect, I don't know if Mr. Uh, Tra agrees, that, but in my view, what really matters is also the, the sequencing of reforms. He doesn't really mention anything about that. So this is something which is, in my view, uh, quite important. Another aspect, the sustainability of the debt. You know, in this country, we live with myths. And the myth of the last three or four years is the huge surpluses of the budget. And a mistake, I think, given by the creditors is that they stress the primary uh, surpluses. If you take, someone has to pay for, for the interest, however. So if we go, to the overall deficit, from what I read in the, in the budget, it's only 1.2%. I think that if this country has gained something during the crisis, is that we have convinced the markets that we can have surpluses. And now, everybody, politicians, all political parties, reduce surpluses. Excessive surpluses. There are no excessive surpluses, I'm afraid. And if something happens, and you know, you cannot really easily cut expenditures, but if something happens, we live in a certain world, then we have no buffer. Uh, and I mention this because it's a country which has suffered a lot to deficits. This is, I, I think, another aspect which is worth, worth mentioning. So I would say that it's prudent in the framework of the debt sustainability to stick with surpluses, small surpluses, but to stick with them in the coming years. Uh, another aspect which is also uh, interesting is that uh, a number of chapters refer to the national accounting systems of the country. In my view, these are very, very important. And the proposals that we move to a system of a balance sheet for the public sector is also quite innovative. I think, however, that the only country which has fully implemented such system is New Zealand. Yes, correct. And, and, and some other countries, Australia and other countries, are also uh, doing that. However, I think that before, I mean, we should move into that direction. If we look, however, even 10 years after the crisis, whether we have adopted some elementary accounting systems in the public sector, we'll see that 10 years after the crisis, still, some of the major companies in Greece, hospitals, for example, do not publish a balance sheet every year. They are not audited. So, these are also uh, reforms that were suggested by Troika. I have to admit that. But they have never implement, been implemented. Why? So, not to, to prolong the, uh, the discussion, I would uh, end up by thanking Mr. Tra for this book because uh, it shows us that uh, uh, economics is not a very complex and dismal science. Thanks God there are no complex econometric equations, etc., in this book, so everybody can go through and read it. And from this point of view, I think that uh, it will be very, very useful if Mr. Tra now, he has uh, a job which may not be, you know, taking two, two, very much time to write the second book on the reforms, the proposals of the Troika, which reforms probably were not, you know, the, the appropriate one. Now, from a distance, you can do it very, very easily. And also to mention the resistance for not implementing reforms, but also why how to enhance the capacity of the state to implement the reforms. And in this framework, 
I think that uh, they should spend uh, our creditors more time in insisting of institutional reforms, because reading the chapter written by George Kopitz of the Independent Evaluation Office, I was really impressed by uh, one sentence there when George Kopitz says that, well, when we started these programs, we did not realize that the Greek state did not have the capacity of a Euro area country to implement these changes. And therefore the question is, with the experience from other countries, we, we, how we can find ways to set up such independent institutions uh, which could, like the independent uh, tax authority, which is in my view a major innovation. We should have similar agencies in other areas, particularly in the area of public expenditures, so that uh, uh, we have also more accountability, a, a very, very basic prerequisite for a democracy. And this is something we don't have. So, please, Mr. Tra, now you have probably more time and with a distance. Uh, you can do that because as an insider for a number of years and an outsider now, you can give us some very, very good insights. Thank you very much for the, for the very interesting book. Thanks. <laughs> enlisted Bob Tra in a second career as a, as a writer, popularizer of uh, IMF experience. Uh, maybe we'll arrange for a further uh, presentation of books from, let's say, two years from now. We'll see. He also uh, got us back to the catchphrase implementation, 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 which uh, still resounds to our uh, ears because reforms, which in Greek metarithmisi are rather longish words, have ended up in Greek uh, political language to sound like four-letter words, meaning forbidden words, words that are very dangerous for politicians to try and legislate much more to, to, to try and, and implement. I was expecting more of uh, an academic approach by Vasily Zlapanos. He tricked me in believing that. But we got the presentation of a book that can be read by the layman. Around here, you, you do ha we do have economists of a caliber, but still people have to read easily readable books to start understanding, and this is one of the main benefits that one draws out of Bob Tra's book. <coughs> right, so now to Nikos Vetas, maybe for some more macroeconomic uh, view over the whole business of debt sustainability of the book or whatever. Uh, whatever, as you said. <laughs> so, um, First of all, I'm grateful for the opportunity. I have a few scattered thoughts here. Let me start with what Vasily said about economists versus normal people. Um, you mean economists are not normal? <laughs> that's what I mean. Um, now, um, the issue is that uh, th this question goes in some sense to the core of democracy. We, we are asked to make uh, dec collective decisions every day that are already very difficult. Uh, should we have higher pensions or lower pensions? Uh, should we subsidize this or tax this? Uh, these decisions are getting increasingly complicated uh, and citizens have to be informed, uh, not only about facts, but only also about the way that they should think about all this. Uh, we see this in our country, we see this in other countries, we see this in the best of countries like the US and the UK. So to have some at least basic understanding of these matters is, is not just good for the economy, it's kind of a basis for democracy. And 
sorry for being a little bit melodramatic. So in that sense, this book is amazingly useful. Uh, so Bob, thanks for, for writing it and for the opportunity that you are giving us to, to, to think. Uh, the, the book refers to the first part of the Greek adjustment or Greek crisis. And I say the first part because uh, I, I happen not to believe that the story is over. Uh, we, I, probably it's not going to be the same type of drama and passion. Uh, however, and probably it's not going to be as short as the, and, and dense as the last 10 years. But over the next couple of decades, uh, key decisions will have to be made by everybody, by uh, Greek policymakers, by foreign policymakers, that are going to eventually co-determine what the outcome of all this is, because I don't think we have seen the, the end of the story. And, and this kind of helps you um, with, a, with, with some sort of hypothetical sentences. If you do this, then it's likely that this is going to happen. If you do that, then it's likely it's going to happen. The book has a little bit of a, of, of a kind of triangular uh, structure. The first 12 chapters, they are more like diagnostics, and they build mm -hmm. uh, towards a summary of where we are. And then the final uh, several chapters, they're more on, on policy with particular emphasis on what it is you should be watching mm -hmm. so that over time you're making uh, as good policy decisions uh, as you can. So all this structure is, is, is a very um, uh, well done and it ends with some deep thoughts as to who is the one to whom uh, policy makers should um, answer, um, and who, <coughs> who owns uh, a process like debt, which by its core is an intertemporal um, contract between three entities, mm -hmm. uh, today's Greeks, today's foreigners, but also tomorrow's Greeks. Uh, who are not necessarily on, on the bargaining uh, table. Now, let me just say, so, so th this is a book that should be read by as many people as possible. Uh, let me just make three or four scattered comments. Um, and this is not going to be very um, structured, but anyway. So necessarily, after you are reading such a book, or while you are reading such a book, you, you, have, to, to, you, you have to ask yourself, so have the programs worked so far? And uh, I, th I think in the spirit of the book, we, we have to be honest with ourselves. And at least my answer is that no. The programs have been a miserable failure. Uh, yes, the country has not fallen off the cliff. Yes, the country has not destroyed itself. Yes, the country is no longer a threat for itself or for the Eurozone. However, the structure of the economy has only improved by a little bit. Um, those who would be more productive in terms of physical or human capital have left. And to make things even worse, there isn't much appetite to change. Uh, reform, going back to what Vasily said, is not a one-time thing. It's not going from here to there. Uh, reform refers to a differential equation, is the ability to change, is how you change the system so that it can keep changing in the future. And we, we don't have much of a capacity for this and we don't have much of an appetite for this. Uh, uh, politicians appear uh, tired, citizens certainly are tired, businesses are uh, exhausted and over debt, um, which basically means that uh, the job has not been done. Now, it's, it's a question of whether it could be done. Maybe the problem on day one was so hard that nothing better could be done, but that's a long discussion that perhaps we should, but definitely let us agree that we are not out of the woods yet. Uh, or to put a positive spin on this, what we currently are should not be what we should be hoping we can become. The second issue has to do about debt. 
Uh, Miranda already uh, covered this very carefully. I just have two additional thoughts. For me, the Greek debt, because of its special characteristics, um, is an implicit contract between Greece and the other Europeans. And the implicit contract is that over the next decades, because this is over the next decades, as long as Greece does its part on the structural and uh, fiscal discipline part, the other side may be adjusting because who knows what the needs are going to be down the road. It's impossible to predict what sort of productivity Greece or Europe is going to have. Uh, the word adjustments is not something that the debtors would like to hear, but I don't think that we have to rule this out over the next 10 or 20 or 30 years. Um, necessarily, how this implicit contract is going to play out has to do with how we think the European Union is going to trans, trans, uh, transform itself. Now, the next uh, word I want to uh, talk about, the next concept that is very interesting uh, about the book is about the idea of discipline and who disciplines whom. Uh, this is already 2020, and for several decades back, we already thought that one key disciplining device would be the markets. Uh, the, the markets failed, I think it's fair to say, in the pre-crisis years to see uh, what was happening. The whole plan of making the Eurozone was that capital is going to flow from the core to the periphery, so that through higher capital, labor productivity would also increase. That was the plan, as I understood it. However, there would also have to be um, a transmission of these funds towards pockets that would indeed increase this productivity, and that we didn't see. So there was a waste of, of money, and it's unclear to me whether risk, even in Europe, is, is priced right uh, at the current juncture. So who is disciplined? all this? Is it, is, it, is it the European institutions? Is it the citizens that have learned perhaps their lesson and they're disciplining the policy makers? Which, which, brings, um, which brings us to, which brings me closer to the end of my remarks, but uh, th this brings also the, the concepts, the, some sense of tools for this discipline. Okay, the idea already mentioned of a country trying to think at least in terms of the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. What are my assets and what are my li liabilities? How to develop the value of my assets and at the same time how to accurately measure my liabilities like pensions and other such liabilities. This is key. In some sense it's easier said than done. Uh, that's why this is not unif uh, uni uniformly adapted. Uh, as, as you know, uh, the European Union is now pushing in that uh, direction. Uh, certainly, it's very useful to not only be thinking in terms of uh, cash or flows, but of thinking in terms of value of assets. Um, so I think this is, this is useful for us to be thinking in that direction. But to be honest, the key disciplining factor over the last 10 years has been one, fear. The fear is that something even worse is going to happen. And whatever reforms happened, they only happened because of fear. Um, we even tended to vote for certain parties because of the fear that the others would be even worse. But fear is not a good motivating factor. It definitely doesn't help build uh, social uh, cohesion and, and optimism. Um, let me just finish with something that is uh, a, a little bit obvious, but underlies uh, the usefulness of, of the book. Um, looking back, if, if there should be one lesson that we learned, is, is, is how toxic the effect of lack of clarity is. Uh, even thinking about the projections within the programs, and how off 
the macro predictions were from what ended up. The fact that everybody was telling everybody that these programs will be done, if not in two years, maybe in three. Um, the lack of connection between the Greek programs and the European dynamic. And definitely the way politicians have been talking to us, the citizens, and us, the citizens, talking to the politicians. Even today, there is a lot of fear in this dialogue between policymakers and citizens. Um, since, since, since you left, we have also renamed everything, so it, it was no longer the Troika, it was the institutions, and, and other things like that. I could make a very long list. But this, this was a way to avoid hard truths. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and in my view, this is, this is a very useful uh, tool in terms of to make us think that there is a way ahead, but that way ahead uh, has to be built on, on, on more truth. Thank you. If I may say uh, so, words of wisdom from, uh, from Nikos Vetter, maybe because I happen to agree with most of his comments, uh, not exactly a macroeconomic overview, but quite a lot of political economy. The stress on intertemporal, intergenerational agreements, silent or otherwise, and the possibility of seeing such agreements to fall apart in the future are extremely important. And also the way in which he, with a clear cut no, he gave the reply to his own question, have the programs succeeded? Uh, they tend to shed light on the realities of the Greek economy after the period of Mnemonion, the memorandum, uh, the hateful memorandum uh, period, as it uh, came to be known in, in Greek uh, public opinion. But he also gave us much to think about the future and how this kind of future would evolve out of the EU's own future evolution. Because the, being in Greece, we tend to look up to Brussels or to the European Union as something more well organized and uh, more stable with a clearer view to the future. It isn't so. There you have quicksands lurking, and the future of the Greek economy, political system, society, is going to be spent on trying to negotiate a way through the quicksands of the future of Europe. But this is an aside comment. And now, Joros Apokosandinou, the first one who had the not so enviable task to come to terms with whatever, the Troika, the program, <coughs> the mnemonio, uh, both a politician and an economist, he at times got the worst of both. He survived, he's here to give us his view. Thank you very much and it's a pleasure to be here. I have 12 remarks. I have numbered them and this will make it easier for both for me and hopefully for you. My first remark is that it's actually a miracle we're having this discussion. Think back to 2011, 2012, an IMF man in the center of Athens without two bus loads of policemen <laughs> outside being able to have a reasonable discussion about the Greek situation. Okay, so 2012, 2015, 2016, it's a miracle we're having it. That's my first remark, and it's, it's, a, it's a sign that even though, as uh, I think most, uh, everyone who spoke before me said, you know, we're not out of the woods, but you know, we have advanced. Second remark is, is a personal story. I'm, I will tell you my first meeting with Bob, because we have history here. And uh, it's April 2010, the IMF has arrived uh, in Athens, and we are negotiating informally still, 
And we, uh, together with uh, Filippo Sakinidis and George Zanyas, we take the team the, of the IMF for dinner uh, in a very nice restaurant. And yeah, Bob is Dutch, as you know, my wife is Dutch, so I bring along my wife, uh, thinking, you know, it's no. kind of, we'll make a... And we're having, it's a very pleasant dinner, and as afterwards we're going home in the car, my wife turns to me and said, I'm going to tell you something. I said, what? She says, you know, at the end of the dinner, Bob turned to me and said in Dutch, your husband has no idea what is coming up. <laughs> so, and he was right. This was, I think we all underestimated the kind of period we were getting into. Third comment, Bob and numbers. Bob loves numbers. He believes numbers tell the truth. Okay? <laughs> He's got this fantastic phrase, which I will read in Greek. Μερικά πράγματα είναι δύσκολο να ποσοτικοποιηθούν, όπως η αγάπη, η γλυπτική, η λεγοτεχνία ή η μουσική, but it is hard to have a program if you cannot measure it. And this, I think, is, was Bob's big contribution in our country, which is he actually taught people how to look at numbers. Uh, we know that you know, his, all the IMF public sort of image was not exactly positive. But the people who worked with Bob on the numbers were amazed by his understanding of the Greek economy more than many people who've been looking at the numbers for a very, very long time. And he taught a whole generation of people in the in general accounting office, excellent professionals themselves, how to look at the numbers of the Greek economy. And even in areas that you wouldn't have thought, for example, the energy system and how it works and who pays what to whom. He actually uh, made very simple graphs, very simple tables to make people understand what they were looking at. I think that, that by itself was a very important contribution. Fourth comment related to this one is transparency. He's got a little chapter saying, ask the people. And from the beginning, I remember him saying, communicate, communicate, communicate. You know, publish information. And especially given what we were coming out of, which was a period in which the government was not only not publishing but falsifying information, to actually come clean with information was a very important first step towards what he and Nikos mentioned before, which is the difficulty of communicating and telling to people what the real story is as you move ahead. Uh, fourth remark. This is not a book that looks backwards, but uh, there's a little chapter called Daedalus Ignore the Omens, which reminds us all about how we got into this in the first place, which is by mismanagement over a very, very long time. And of course, the fact that it's a very, very long time is why to also get out of it, we need a lot of time. Uh, fifth, um, sorry, sixth comment, he has a phrase in there which will shock people. Uh, but it's actually a true phrase. He says, the recession is a natural phenomenon. When you are in the state that you are, uh, to actually go through a very heavy recession is a natural phenomenon. Now, I agree with this in principle. What I, again, this is not a book about the crisis itself. And in that sense, it doesn't really address the question that was asked, for example, whether the program is successful or not. But it is an interesting analytical and certainly political question of how much of the unavoidable recession was actually avoidable with different choices that we could all have made, both Greeks and Europeans. Um, seven point, and that's, this is where it begins to get uh, kind of more serious. Uh, he, fundamentals. This is a rather depressing book uh, in the sense that if you look at the fundamentals that he is laying out, it doesn't look pretty as we move ahead. And even though it is a book that I would recommend to politicians, politicians are not going to have a very good time reading it. He says that, yes, there's enormous progress between 2009 and 2018. He's got this fantastic intertemporal balance sheet, and he compares the two, and it's, it, it shows a big. But then he says, look, your population will go down, employment will go down, Productivity needs to go up to at least 1.5%, and you need to remain com competitive to keep inflation less than 1.75%. This means you're going to have meager growth moving forward. Therefore, no new nominal debt, 
in an environment of rising interest rates plus the cost of aging. Now, if you pull that together, it's a difficult uh, to put it in Greek. Point number eight, Saint Augustine. Lord, give me purity, but not quite yet. So, you know, yes, I need to reduce the debt, but not quite yet. And here is a point which I think uh, I would like to see this more public. Pop makes a very simple observation. He says, look, 2016, 2017, you had the surplus, but your debt went up in nominal terms. How is that possible? It's not just stock flow adjustments that economists like to play with. This is a real important issue. Somebody needs to explain this, and nobody, to my mind, has done it uh, rather uh, convincingly. So if we're not reducing our nominal debt, a nominal debt, I mean the debt, not the debt to GDP ratio, the, the actual debt, in an environment of overshooting the primary surplus targets, Something very bad is, 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 is going on. So this links, of course, to the whole debt sustainability discussion. He's got a very interesting proposal for conditional debt reduction by our partners uh, as we do privatizations, et cetera. Point number nine, fiscal. He says, look, there's actually, there was a logic behind the Maastricht criteria of 60% of debt to GDP. And the logic is, is mathematics. It says that if you divide that the debt to GDP ratio is you divide the deficit by the nominal growth. So a deficit of 3%, which is your, your, your goal, a nominal growth by 5%, 3 divided by 5 is 0.6, 60%. Now, if you take this to the Greek case, your nominal growth is not going to be more than 2.5%. So if you want to keep the 3%, this will tell you, if you do the, little, uh, the exercise, that you need to keep long-term a deficit which is not higher than 1.5%. Now, long term, that's not easy to do. So this is something to remember as we move forward. Tenth point, uh, and to me, the crux of the matter is, is actually the next three points that I'm going to make. Uh, potential growth. And here's the problem. He, doesn't, he discusses it, but he doesn't dwell on it too much, because I think if he did, we would all get very depressed. Potential growth rate, long term, half a percentage point of GDP a year? If we manage to get it a bit higher, this is extremely low. What does long-term potential growth depend on? It depends on two things, and it covers both, productivity growth and uh, the employment side, the, the, the labor participation and the like. And he focuses on productivity. That's my 11th point. And he says, he has a very nice phrase again, he says, in the short run, productivity is a parameter. In the long run, productivity is everything. And here the question is, okay, we've been reforming now for what, 10 years? Because we have been reforming. And yet we don't really see it in the productivity statistics. And we better start seeing it, because if we don't see the impact of the reforms on productivity, if we don't manage to get productivity up to the 1.5% that he's saying, or even higher, we're in trouble. Because that's what's going to drive long-term potential growth in this country. So the real question is, are we doing enough on productivity? And here, of course, uh, okay, this is not the point of this book, but it would be interesting to have more robust, beyond labor productivity, sort of looking at more complex measures of productivity and see what we can. But all the structural reforms that we've been doing should at some point be reflected one way or another in the productivity figures. And we're not yet seeing that. Final point. Uh, the question of choices and sovereignty. And uh, again, I will read the phrase in Greek. Οι επιλογές είναι κυριαρχικό δικαίωμα. Η ανάγκη για συνέπεια όμως είναι νόμος της φύσης. Okay. So he's talking about self-restraint. And here's the problem. This is a very Calvinist book. <laughs> for a country which is decidedly non-Calvinist. And uh, it's, it's an ode to a country that he has learned to love while recognizing all its problems. And he's setting out in a very rational Calvinist way the path forward. Can we take that path or not, given the nature of the country? And it's, I think that certain elements, we have shown that it is possible to reform. 
But uh, given how long-term the effort needs to be, there are reasons to doubt. And I will stop on this optimistic point. <laughs> While I was counting through the 12 points, I was dearly hoping that Joris um, Vogosandino would stop at around 8. When he got to 11, I had the urge of cutting the mic, which is not a way to, to do things. But to be very earnest, I, ho I dearly hope that this kind of books, this kind of approach, could be read, could be followed by our dear political class. And it's uh, a very positive thing that we don't have elections forthcoming, at least hopefully so, in the next, let's say, 18 months. Because to realize that the long term is the long term, but it is there, it is lurking there, it, won't, it, it can't be pushed, it can't be shoved aside. It's already a difficult political equation. But now, the floor to Bob Tra for his counting, his explaining, his uh, shifting possibly the discussion to the future, his reading of the future. Mr. Tra. Okay, mic is on. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for being here. It's a great honor for me to talk to so many people and hear the comments from my colleagues that I have worked with. Sometimes we were on the other side of the table, but uh, that doesn't really matter because we all strove for the same objective, and it is how to assist Greece in overcoming this very complex uh, situation and this difficult uh, crisis. Um, before, I, I have two things for you. I have a few updates. Uh, George said I love numbers, so what I do, it is now early 2020. I wrote the book between July and September 2018. I had, at the time, access to numbers through the first quarter of 2018. And I have updated a few selected numbers to see how things are going. Um, because it's true, the first 12 chapters are building blocks, the basic plan that Odysseus is going to help us with to get back home from 185% of GDP land to Ithaca, where debt is below 60% of GDP. That voyage is very long, and uh, Odysseus describes in chapter 13 a possible path of how you can do that. And then the next 12 chapters, are all monitoring. What do you look at in order to see whether the economy is on track, whether this plan is doing okay, or whether we should adjust the sales of our boats? So I think that monitoring what you're doing, or what I have called results-oriented monitoring, is as important as making the plan itself. And uh, that is uh, the structure of the book, as, as Nikos uh, referred to, it was done on purpose. So let me give you just a few uh, small updates because there's some interesting information that I thought uh, we can share. The first picture is about demographics. Uh, you see three lines in this picture. The first one is what I had seen in 2011 when we started uh, population projections. These are done by uh, Greek demographers but communicated to Eurostat and to the United Nations. Um, this, the second uh, dark line, let me see, it's the black line, the bottom one is 218. This is the line of population projections that is embedded in the programming and the numbers of the book. And the middle line, 220, <coughs> is the most recent population projection for Greece. So we see the same pattern that the population is forecast to decline. But there is a little bit of an uplift from uh, 218. It, it doesn't look as though the population will decline quite as fast as we thought, as the demographers thought in 218. This difference that you have a country with more people in it allows you, if you employ them, 
to have larger GDP. And that helps in carrying debt. So demographics are extremely important to determine the size of your economy in absolute terms, together with productivity. It's not just how many people do we have, but what is also the quality of our people, of our human resources. So therefore, investing needs to take place both in physical capital and also in human capital. That is productivity, but this is volumes. So it still is a declining demographics, but it's a slightly better than uh, what I had in 2018. And this difference, I computed the effect, it gives you about 0.15% growth on average per year. So if my 2018 result was uh, average growth of about, uh, say, three quarters of a percent, then now you are closer to 0.9 or 1% on average, given these demographics and given an assumption, and this is a critical assumption, that reforms will in fact come through and lift productivity growth per employed person in Greece to 1.5% per year. And we can look at that a bit later. The second uh, picture shows you the working age population, because population, you know, not everybody is employed, and we also have growing dependency. So you need to extract from the population numbers how many people are in the working pool, and this is typically seen between 15 and 65 years of age. We can extend this to uh, 67. Uh, unfortunately, the demographic numbers that I have access to, because this is all from the web, this is public information, do not give me the cohorts to 67. But that, of course, Greece, uh, in its own statistical framework, can do this. If this is an important variable to monitor, I would ask the statistical office and the demographers to back this out and to give this number. I don't think it makes a huge difference, but it may make a slight difference. Again, we see that the working age population also continues to decline as we had before, but again, slightly better, slightly more people. I'm not sure that more people is necessarily better, but you have a little bit bigger population than was in the book in 2018. The third picture shows you what the difference in potential output growth is, and this is all logical, so it's not that I want these results to come out, I just let the numbers inform me what might happen if these demographics are there and if productivity growth can be lifted gradually, not all at once, to 1.5%. And there we see that the new line for the 2020 projections, in the 2020s, you now have growth going to 2%, and that is basically the absorption of all the unemployed. So this is again embedding a very important assumption, namely that the country is successful in bringing the reservoir of unemployed people back into the labor force, into employment. If that happens, then you can generate growth of around 2% for a few years. And we are now at that stage, because unemployment is coming down, and uh, growth is close to 2%, which of course is a recovery period, and growth of 2% in the recovery period, other things being equal, is not spectacular. You know, 4% would be very good. 2% is still, for Greece, good, because I think in terms of potential growth, and I look at the constraints for growth. So you need to be realistic. Politicians don't like this and find me pessimistic, but I would argue that if you deny nature, you're gonna lose. So don't, don't pretend as though the reality will be optimistic because the, the errors that you poss possibly make and mislead the people in believing that everything will be fine is gonna be very, very uh, hard. And it also leads to uh, an, an increment in debt at the end of the day, because people then take on debt, they think everything will be fine in the future, and then they find out it is not, and then you have very high debt that you have to deal with. And that is a little bit the crux of Greece in the past, is constantly overestimating what the economy could do, but borrowing against these expectations which were then disappointed, and that gets you into trouble. So I, I talk in the book about whether you should be cautious and hoping that you can overperform a little bit or promise a lot and then deal with the problems if they come when it's a bit disappointing. I, I am, and perhaps this is Calvinistic, I don't know. I would much rather celebrate by under-promising and over-delivering 
than the other way around. Because the other way around is exactly the path to excess debt, and that is a very complicated problem and becomes a psychological problem for countries. It breaks down confidence. Nobody believes the political system anymore when they constantly overpromise and underdeliver. You really, I think, need to uh, put this the other way around. Be cautious. Don't tell people that everything will automatically be fine. And then overdeliver. That that is, I think, the golden the golden rule. But uh, this is a little bit culture dependent, uh, certainly. The next picture is uh, one of the critical ones, together with the demographics or number of people. And here we see something uh, interesting and not so positive. This is the productivity growth numbers derived from the published quarterly national accounts and employment. Now look at the end of this graph on the right-hand side. You see the black line that is crossing through zero at around 218. That was the 218 numbers. This is in the book. So productivity growth was just about starting to become positive again as the economy recovered in 218 with the numbers that are used in the book. Now that has disappointed. When I update the numbers, then we get to the lower line, the 220 line, where you see a very big dip in 219, productivity sharply negative. And you can ask yourself the question, well, why did this happen? And there's only one word, elections. What happens in Greece when there are elections? Everybody and his uncle in the public sector starts hiring people. Now, they are not producing suddenly, within two quarters, an enormous amount of GDP. They basically produce nothing. But they are employed, so your productivity tanks, because productivity is output divided by employment. So here we have again a case where an electoral period led to an employment boom short-term, very short-termism, and that depressed your productivity growth. So my productivity line is disappointing. And I, I just said that in terms of volume of people that can help to produce GDP, my numbers have gotten better. In terms of productivity growth, my numbers have gotten worse. So between these two, and this often happens, you are back to where you were before, potential growth of between, let's say, three quarters of a percent. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't overpromise and then tell the public that you go ahead and have a party because growth is taking off. I don't think this is going to happen. And productivity disappoints, and this is also related to where are the reforms and when are these things starting to show. Now, the next picture, and I have emphasized this in the book, to me is fascinating. I would love to do this for other countries and see if I find the same thing. This is employment in the public sector and in the private sector, starting at an index number of 100 in 2001 and ending in 2019. And what we see here is, and you have to remember that the economy of Greece, given the deep recession that has taken place in 2019 was slightly smaller than in 2001 in real terms. Of course, in nominal terms, it was bigger, but in real terms, what actually got produced, it was a little bit smaller. According to the numbers, this year in 2020, you start crossing over that level of 2001, and you start getting bigger again. Now, that is interesting. Because if the economy, let's say, was a little bit smaller in 2019 than in 2001, how did the private sector respond to this, and how did the public sector respond to this? Well, the public sector is employing almost 20% more people than in 2001, even though the economy is smaller. And the private sector, and this is a sure bet, because the private sector, in order to stay alive, if you have a company, you need productivity. Otherwise, you're not going to survive. And what do we see in the numbers? Sure enough, the, pri the, uh, the private sector employs 12% less employees than in 2001. So they improved productivity by force, because when a, a private company goes bankrupt, you're dead, you're away. When the government goes bankrupt, they come to you and they raise your taxes. They never go away. 
So the constraints that the private sector has relative to a public sector, to a politician, are very, very different, and you see that in the numbers. Now, there is another implication here, and that as we move along in time, this country, Greece, in relative terms, this is not in absolute terms, but in relative terms, is shifting labor resources from the private sector, which is relatively getting smaller, to the public sector, which is relatively getting bigger. Do you want to do this if you favor productivity growth? And the answer is no, because the weighted average of putting more and more people in a sector that has low productivity growth and less and less people in a sector that has more productivity growth means you are depressing productivity growth for the macroeconomy as a whole. So, you know, this is a pretty, I, I was amazed by seeing these numbers when I plotted the data. And there's another interesting thing. During this two decades, new democracy, the conservatives, had more years in office than any other party. And typically speaking, this is the same with Mr. Trump in the US. They say we favor small government and, and less government interference. And I have no message with regards to whether you believe that ideologically or not. But even conservative governments hire awful lot of people in the government and they are not reducing employment. The only government that reduced employment was this gentleman who sits next to me here. There was a labor government and uh, it lasted only 11 months because they booted him out because this was terrible to fire so many people in the public sector. But that was the only government that really significantly reduced employment in the public sector was a labor government. So if you look, if you listen to the rhetoric in politics, you often have to think, is the opposite actually the truth? Because they're trying to convince me of something else that they want me to eat up. So always go to the numbers, forget about the stories, and look at the numbers. The truth is in the numbers. It's not in what politicians tell you. This is important because people are fooled all the time in political rhetoric. You should not accept it. You should ask the government, explain to me in numbers what you are doing and what your view is for the future. And do not, don't do it for me because I'm above 60. Do it for my children because they have to pay the bills that I'm going to leave behind. So it needs to be intertemporal and forward-looking and not uh, find stories that make me feel good, whereas I have the suspicion that not everything is quite as healthy as it might be. The next picture is again back to productivity. And what do I see here? Well, I see a mini collapse in investment spending in 18 and 19. Again, during electoral, up to electoral periods, investment spending in Greece simply had another mini collapse. So where is this productivity going to come from? Because labor becomes more productive as it has better and more machines, capital to work with. But here, capital investment is being depressed. And relative to the euro area, which is the dotted line, which is recovering, uh, Greece is not really recovering investment. So there is something happening in the economy and in the politics that keeps the investors away. I, we can check that, I don't, I, but I, I think the, 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 the targets were met in part by cutting capital spending. The private sector also doesn't spend very much. Typically there is a, a symbiotic relationship. If you have good public capital, then it makes it more profitable for businesses to invest. So it, it, it's, it goes together often in most countries. So this gap in investment effort is huge between average EU or Euro country and Greece. And as a result, the counterpart of this is that consumption spending out of GDP, because these are ratios to GDP in Greece, are huge, close to 90%. In the European Union, this is about 75% or less. So you have also the structure of spending, in my view, is incorrect. That is a macroeconomic problem. There's not enough saving, there's too little investment. And to fix that is not an issue that you can do in the short term. That takes a long time. Then the last one is table seven. I have updated the dashboard that is at the end of the book. 
what we see there is that despite the fact that the government has been running surpluses, the debt has been going up, which is a conundrum that the government needs to explain. Uh, the gross debt, even in percent of GDP, has increased. It's now coming down. Hopefully, it will go down a lot further. Labor productivity is barely positive. You see that has been negative in the past. It's now starting to recover. That's good. CPI inflation is less than in the Eurozone, which is also good. I, I argue in the book that competitiveness for Greece has not been fully restored, but you can do that. So there is no reason to uh, stop trying to regain uh, productivity. Employment growth is very strong, but we now know in part where that is. This is mostly in the public sector <laughs> lately, but let's hope it can continue to improve. Unemployment is, of course, coming down. That's good. You can absorb lots of people, and you have short-term room to grow. The consumption share, you see, is 87%. This is really way too high. And uh, this is a structural underlying feature of the Greek economy. In economics, we say that relative prices are not correct. That means you are not competitive enough to favor investment and export and, and instead of consumption. The export share is growing. That's a very good thing. And I think there has been progress in, in competitiveness gains. Uh, this is still very small. 37% of GDP is small. Uh, average European countries are close goods and services. Yeah, it's close to 60. The the Netherlands uh, we uh, we are completely dependent on foreign trade. If you take exports and imports, in the Netherlands is well over 100 percent of GDP. So we're completely dependent on foreign trade. Fixed investment share 11.1. This is really uh, a wake up call. External current account, here's another reason why I think competitiveness has not been restored. Greece is, has an economy that should really be bigger because you have lots of people still that you can employ. So there should really be a lot more aggregate demand still in the economy. But even with this depressed aggregate demand, you run a current account deficit, and this is permanent. This is always, every year, Greece runs a current account deficit. What does that mean? That means that even with this depressed aggregate demand, the domestic supply of goods and services in the economy is not keeping up. And that means, in my view, that Greece has a supply problem. You don't have an aggregate demand problem. And for that, you need investment, you need reforms, you need uh, productivity growth, etc. So all of these variables start, if you look at many numbers, they start pointing a flashlight on the same underlying issues. The primary balance has been uh, strong, and I, I have to tell you, I'm here now for a few days, and I read before I came here, and one thing that worries me a little bit is that the impression that gets created, and maybe this is incorrect, is that the interest rates have now come down and we placed a 15-year bond and the problem has been resolved. That this problem that we had before has melted away like a snow cone in Phoenix. And that is, of course, another trap that you can fool yourself with, that you can, because everybody now says, oh, we can do a much lower primary surplus. And I, I, uh, if I were a young person in Greece, that would give me the willies because uh, I still want to. The IMF says until 2032, you can kind of maintain your debt payments. Well, 2032 is 12 years from now. That's nothing. Uh, if you are a young person in Greece or a young professional, 12 years is just not enough for safety. This is too much risk. You want your debt to be sustainable well beyond 2032. So don't start lowering the primary surplus because your debt service costs in the short run are somewhat less and the interest rate is somewhat lower. What you do is you get the problem fixed earlier because you're being, is a gift. Suddenly, Greece has a gift of very low current interest rates. Use it to pay off your higher interest rate debt and get your amortization down faster. It's like a, a couple that has bought a big house, very happy, and uh, they uh, have a huge mortgage, 
And then the bank calls them up and he says, you know what, we are a really nice bank. You, for the next six months, you don't have to pay the mortgage. We just capitalize it at the end. And then the man says, honey, look, this is fantastic. Our problem has been solved. I want this bigger SUV and this vacation to Ibiza, you know, we, we can do it now, but this, the bank is helping us. The sirens of debt are whispering to us that we just, you know, don't worry about this. You are now have to pay less in the next few months and uh, have a party. Well, this is, of course, a straight trap. Because when this debt matures, or after six months, boom, there goes your debt servicing cost, and then you haven't been preparing. Instead, the couple should use this money, this time period, to get the mortgage down faster and pay less interest. But this is the Calvinist approach to, uh, <laughs> yes. Well, um, so, I think these updates are interesting because the demographics look a little bit better. Productivity looks worse. There are um, issues about investment that are new. This is lower than what I had anticipated. And I, I may perhaps just respond to a few remarks that were made. And I, I'm very grateful for the feedback. I should say also, and this is very unpolite, the first person I should thank is Alexandra Vovolini, because she's been very patient with me to get this book out. So I'd like to thank you uh, for this. It's a, it's a great honor to see it in print. Um, very quickly, a few things, if I may pick it up. The issue of 15 to 64 instead of 15 to 67, uh, this is true, is not in the book, but it, it can be done, I think, if the statistics break out how many people are available. The one thing that has happened is the pension reform has made a huge difference early in the program because my n net worth in the balance sheet was very, very negative because of the, the aging cost, and then it collapsed <coughs> after the pension reform. So this pension reform that Greece has done was huge, and it made a big difference in the intertemporal balance for the country. So uh, it's not true that Greece has not achieved anything with its fiscal adjustment or structural reforms. If you look at the intertemporal balance sheet, that is an enormous improvement, but it's very, very hard. And people do not see, they don't understand what it means that you have a future cost that you have taken out of the equation. This is politically one of the most difficult things to explain, because it's really, really good for the country. It's, you have taken away a potential debt in the future, uh, and it's a huge amount. So I would argue that the pension reforms that Greece has done were very good. I'm a bit worried that they are slowly being reversed. Maybe that's not the case, but I hear stories that they are being reversed kind of bit by bit, and this is very populist, of course, and you want to do nice things for the people, and then, of course, what they're gonna face is the next crisis when the debt interest rates spike up and the bills are coming due. Um, new laws, what is the impact and the sequencing of reforms? This, these are all uh, right on the money, very important. My interpretation of why reforms in Greece don't show very much is one word in which you are all experts. It's called parathyrakia. <laughs> I learned the meaning of parathyrakia when I lived in Greece. This is passing laws through Congress to Parliament that have so many loopholes in them, and the experts already know before the law goes to Parliament, and we didn't, so we then approved disbursements on the basis of these laws, thinking that this was going to change things. And then people came to my office and said, do you know what? Nothing has changed. Because the loopholes that were built into these laws make them basically work at 5% effectiveness rather than 75% effectiveness. So parathyrakia is a skill that in two and a half thousand years Greece has perfected. You have become the experts in the world of parathyrakia. There's another word that goes with this, kutopuluria, is that correct? Being too smart by half for your own good? Kutopuluria. 
So you have beautiful words for everything. And I, as an outsider, had no clue what these things meant. But you keep complaining that you do all the reforms and productivity doesn't go up. Well, my answer is parathyrakia. Uh, accounting is still not good. Uh, not all the published accounts. I, I couldn't agree more. But if you do a balance sheet, you need audited annual accounts. So if you focus on the balance sheet and the government starts introducing it in the budget document, then gradually I predict the pressure on producing annual accounts will increase. So you need an incentive also. It's not enough to tell a story that people understand. You need a little incentive to make them actually do it. And therefore, balance sheets are very important. Uh, need more emphasis on institution building. There is one closet in the Ministry of Finance, and you should never open the door of that closet because you're going to die. Behind this door is a stack of technical assistance reports that we have produced over time, which is now so big that if it falls on you, you're dying. But they have been nicely placed in the closet in the Ministry of Finance for nobody ever to look at. So it is not true that uh, the European Commission had even a special regime. Where, what was it called? The, the Technical Assistance Secretariat. At some point, I counted, we had 70 people, seven task force, 70 people in Athens. The ministers didn't know which way to look because there were way too many consultants running around making recommendations. It was just an overflow of technical assistance. So it is not correct to say that this was not addressed, but the country simply could not absorb it. And this is an important lesson. You need to, some has been, yes, some has been, but you need to be careful with um, expectations of how fast things can change. This is a, this is a lesson that I have learned uh, because it takes time to, to make these reforms take hold in the country. And you need to communicate, you need to show, then you need to do results-oriented monitoring. And if nothing gives, then you know the parathyrakia have been at work. You need to go back and do it again. Mr. Samaras complained to me at one point, and he says, well, you make me take measures every time, and then you come back, and then there's new measures. I said, well, Mr. Samaras, the previous measures didn't do anything. So that is inefficient. And, but unfortunately, you know, every country struggles with this problem. This is not particular to Greece, but uh, it, it is, it is uh, what it is here. And, and I look at the productivity numbers, and I just don't see the productivity numbers jumping. So that means something still needs to be fixed. Um, questions are increasingly complicated, and how do we communicate this to the public? My preferred way to do this is to present quantified scenarios, simple scenarios. They shouldn't be complicated. No catenary turnpike theorems of any kind, but just simple time series to show where the debt is going, where the deficit is going long term, because short term blips should mostly be ignored. But if you do quantified analysis and show the public, uh, there are a surprising number of people who know how to interpret these things. And they give you feedback. And then they tell you, you've missed something. And that feedback from the public is very important. Generations are important. We, we tend to make policy based on the next election. What is the time frame for the next election? So my book is completely different because I think of the next generation and the one that follows. If you pitch your policies to sustainability in that context, then you look at the world suddenly very differently because the, the short-term blips are no longer important and you look for underlying structural movements and, and uh, uh, trends. So generations are important. And you know this girl in Sweden, what is her name? Greta Thunberg. She is, of course, but she's 16, 17 years old. She cannot know macroeconomic issues. Uh, the, the Secretary of the Treasury in the US complained she should first go to the university and study economics. I think she, intuitively she knows more about economics than he does because she, her instincts are exactly right and his instincts are exactly devious. So uh, you need to think about 
in, in terms of one or two generations in order to make policy that is structural and that really benefits the country in the long term. Um, the debt, there's a special, uh, thus Nikos made this point, this is a special characteristic of the debt because there's an implicit contract with the Europeans. So what happens with the debt depends in part on what the Europeans want to do. I'm very sympathetic with that, but if I were a Greek, I would not buy this because I will determine what happens with my debt, not the Europeans. And therefore, I would make the decision, we are going to make a plan to pay this down so that we are safe, and I'm not going to make myself dependent on whether the Germans or the Dutch have a hiccup tomorrow and suddenly they don't want to contribute anymore to uh, helping Greece with the huge subsidies that are built into your debt stock today. Because when this debt rolls over, it has to be rolled over on market terms, and we don't know what the market terms 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years from now will be. So I don't think you can place this debt continuously at a subsidized rate. So you don't want to be dependent on what the Europeans think. You make your own decisions. You determine what happens with your debt. The debt is yours. Uh, it's an asset for the Europeans, but it's your debt. So you need to, as a political system, as a country, decide, OK, we're going to make a plan and we determine what happens with our debt, not somebody else. Market discipline failed us. Uh, this is in part true. I think markets are schizophrenic. They are correct on average, but they're not correct every single time. You have overshooting and undershooting, and fear is indeed a very uh, corrosive incentive. You need to explain, you need to build comprehension that is a much stronger basis to help the country go forward than fear. Um, so I, I also, I, I didn't mean to write the book from the context of pessimism. I actually think it is positive and optimistic if you think a path exists that will bring you to a much better situation. So to me, this was actually optimistic. I was very concerned about adverse demographics, that Greece could never get out of this, but I think you can. But it does take a certain policy stance that you need to choose to do. And if you don't want to choose this policy stance, that's legitimate because you determine your preferences, but then you need to be consistent. And then you need to say, OK, we need debt forgiveness at some point, which is not something I recommend, because the markets will then turn against you again. So uh, asking for debt forgiveness seems like an easy solution, but I think this is where the low investment ratios come from, and you don't really want that. So I have tried to find a way, quantitatively, to see if there is a path that exists that will bring the people of Greece home to a much lower debt, much safer debt ratio. And that immediately struck me that this is an Odysseus task because it takes 60 years to get home. And the side constraints that I put on the model is I don't want to increase the primary surplus again because this is too much. I don't want to bring it down either. I want to keep it here for a while. That's OK. Then you have an, a zero fiscal impulse. So you're not adding or you're not subtracting from growth from the fiscal point of view. I wanted to take account of the demographics, because that's nature. You should never ignore nature. Don't assume it away. Um, and I, to my surprise, there is a path that exists, and there may be many, that brings you home. It takes long, but you are in charge. The country is in charge. You are not asking others for debt forgiveness. And uh, the per capita income over this whole period keeps going up. It's not spectacular, but you, you get wealthier and wealthier. It seems to me that for future generations, that is not the worst that could happen. So this is why I wrote it down. And, and you know there may be people that are much better versed in this than I am who can find a path that is actually gives you higher 
per capita GDP at the end of the ride and is also politically feasible. That would be great. But that, this is why these things are for discussion. And I really don't, I don't pretend that I have a crystal ball to tell you what happens for the next 60 years. But if you monitor it every year, then you know where the pressure points come and you can adjust the sales and, and avoid, and, and don't listen to the sirens of debt because they will constantly call you out and say, oh, a little bit more debt is okay. You know, lower the primary surplus and we'll have a party. And these girls are very beautiful and irresistible, but you have to put the plugs in your ears and don't listen to the sirens of debt and, and just uh, determine your own path going forward. Uh, that's uh, what I thought I could uh, say. Right. In his uh, gentle, subdued uh, tone, Vautra has put a meteorite in the center of Athens. If I was putting out a daily newspaper and I was asked by my, my managing editor to suggest a headline, having looked at the slides and at the final comments, I would advise for this headline to be out, no more than that. In Greece, in the last uh, 30 years or so, just two times under-promising and over-performing were tried. The first time is, was in 85, 86. The second time was in uh, 91, 92. In both times, those who engineered overperforming without overpromising didn't get uh, a very positive comment, uh, not a very positive result, result of the urns. So it's political death. And the way in which uh, Bob Trapp proved was that he has turned native, <laughs> meaning he understands totally and wholly how things work in Greece, make me now to try and call uh, Alexandra Vavolini to the stand to try and explain to us why the hell she, she did, decided to publish <laughs> this book in Greek, in Greece, 2020. Uh, you might come over here. A special occasion to hear all our problems in a, in an organized way. Thank you very much, first of all, all of you, and all of you that were so patient as it, as it was a seminar at a university. Just to tell you that I'm my family is in this business for 86 years, and we are still here. Uh, see also what uh, other books we have written about the, uh, we published, not, uh, we published about the crisis. And uh, hopefully, as Bob says, uh, the next generations will listen somehow with a miracle. Thank you. Thank you to all of you.